Hello data teams. Let's say in your data strategy for the next six to 12 months, you have a nice little asset. And this little asset says, you want to help the product, the growth, the sales team and the marketing team to get more insights out of their data, to use these kind of insights to make better product sales, marketing and growth decisions. And this sounds very abstract and it might take some work to basically break it down, but we have to talk about one elephant in the room. And this elephant is self-service analytics. Uh, and I know, yes, it's cringy. We all have been there. So. Yes, everyone who has worked in data, when you mention self-service analytics, is basically shuddering a little bit. Because like we all saw self-service implementations that were problematic. But let's be true. There is a level of self-service needed. Because we cannot sit next to any marketing product or salesperson all the time and do queries for them. This would be weird for all persons involved. So we have to enable people to go beyond the initial reports and the initial analysis that we create for them to answer the immediate question that they have potentially immediately with let's say one or two clicks. And there are different ways to achieve that. What I want to cover today is how you can use a event analytics tool like Mixpanel to enable self-service use cases. Why using Mixpanel for that? Why not using any kind of other BI tool for that? First of all, because in product, in sales, growth, and marketing, you often analyze sequences. So you are interested in sequences of users, of customers along the way. You're also interested in development of revenue along the way. So you're interested in funnels, you're interested in retention. For marketing, it's super interesting to see if they find some kind of insights within the tool to immediately act on that. So to build a cohort or a segmentation based on that and then use this kind of cohort and segment directly in their marketing tools to build campaigns on top of that. This is something that you can enable much easier in an analytics platform like Mixpanel. And the purpose of this video is, I want to show you, don't be afraid. We don't really build a lot of overhead here. The main purpose of this video is to show you how you can get from a star schema that you most likely will already have in your data model, at least like on the presentation layer already that you send to your BI tool, how you can get from a star schema to event model and very simple steps and you just sync it up into Mixpanel and how you can make three or four teams uh, quite happy with this kind of setup. Let's dive into that. This video is sponsored by Mixpanel. Mixpanel has a new way to do product analytics with your warehouse data. You can connect Mixpanel to your data warehouse and then you can run all the product analytics investigations and all the product analytics deep dives on top of your data warehouse data with clean, prepared and high quality data. Check out the link in the description to learn more about the offering. I'm using it and I'm extremely happy to have this new kind of setup for product analytics because it unlocks so many more use cases on top of much better data than before. Okay, before we get started, let's do some quick theory. When we talk about Starsky, so we usually have this kind of very simplistic model. We have a fact table. We usually also always put them in a the center. And then we have dimensional tables, which are around the fact table. And the principle is that in the fact table, we already have something like an event. I show you an example in a second. And these are then, of course, connected. So we have a reference of this kind of dimension in the fact table, usually as a key. And then once we want to work with this and all the, let's say, typical BI tools, what they do is they quickly just left join all the dimensional values that we need if we want to analyze and when we want to give our fact table a little bit more depth. If we do this, to give you an example, so fact table, for example, in this case, could be like orders. So we have orders and then, for example, the dimensional table here could be the customers. And so in the end, I can analyze all the different kind of orders that has been happening in our online store 
And if I want to understand who is buying that, and if I want to need some information about the dimensions, for example, like where the customers are coming from to make an analysis about, okay, which kind of areas we have generated these kind of orders, I join these two tables and I get the information I can break down by customer city, for example. And so this makes Star Schema extremely powerful and also like the standard. And so if you're watching this and you don't have a Star Schema, maybe I could do another video where, when you, for example, have one big tables because from there it's also not so hard to go there, but I assume that at least like most of the data models that I saw, at some level you have a representation that basically is a Star Schema. Now the big question is, okay, how can we get from here to an event schema and also like why do we have to get to an event schema so in the end the event schema is not so much different so instead of facts so we have the events and again so these can be designed in two different ways it can be one table for all events or it can be different kind of tables for each event and so then in the end we just have a big set of different kind of fact tables the only thing what we do is here is we mostly reduce the data set so it's a bit of reduction and a little bit of transformation we always have to make sure for the event is like that we have a clear timestamp so we have a timestamp present something else that has to be uh, present we need a unique identifier that stitches together all these different kind of events so let's say in our case could be like the customer id and then naturally of course like we need an event name uh, because this is like how we identify this um, later within mix panel. Um, and then we can have the same kind of dimensional data here as well. And we have two different ways how we can work with the dimensional table. So one thing what we can do is, so we can basically, let's say, add it in time. Sounds a bit complex, but what it definitely means, so an event happens in a specific point of time. For example, an order happens on the 22nd of February. And what we can do is so we can pull all the dimensional data that is valid for this kind of time period. What means valid is customer data can change over time. So people can move, they can change their names, they can change their email address, whatever. And so we might have different kind of references if we model it properly. And what we can do here is we do some kind of denormalization here. We add specific kind of dimensional da um, data to the events at the point of time where the event has happening. And so then we can just use and load these kind of properties there. This is definitely a really nice way uh, to model this. If we want to have a little bit more flexibility and more possibilities to change and scale things over time, because once this data is already then imported, it's, it's not so easy to really change it and adapt it. So another way what we can do is we can just map it. I will show you like there's a possibility for mix panel to use lookup tables then the orders when we will have something like a location ID. And for example, we can then take all the information about the location. We have this in a dimensional table. And then we load this dimensional table as a lookup table into mix panel and just map it to the events. So these are the two different ways how we can work with this. And as you can already see, this is not so far away. So honestly, if we are already at a star schema, it's more bringing it all together reducing it at least most of the time i reduce things because we don't really need all the different kind of things that we already do in the fact table on dimensional table and then just make a decision about okay what kind of dimensional table i maybe want to model already into the event table so to make it easier accessible and also to support specific kind of use cases and then what kind of dimensional table i can just add as a lookup table so to enrich my data set later on so i have these two decisions and the whole setup is pretty straightforward when I already have a star schema. This looks nice on a whiteboard. So let's have a look into how this actually works in real life. So let's start first with what kind of data set we are looking at. So I'm using a quite, can we call it famous one? Maybe it's not famous, but at least it's well known. So everyone who basically got started with DBT and did some DBT education material from DBT will came across the Jaffel shop. I have no idea what Jaffles are. This seems to be an American thing. At least in Europe, I never really came across that. Whatever. It's a shop. So it sells products. The nice thing about the Jaffles shop is it's a full extensive DBT project, which you can run locally to learn DBT in different kind of ways. And it's nicely maintained. 
It always gets the kind of new features. Now already it has the metrics layer or semantic layer built in. And it's a really good starting point. There are different versions of the Jaffle shop. So there's also like one with DuckDB where you can immediately start to do everything locally if you don't want to hook up some kind of database behind the scenes. As you can see here, the deck, all the relations that we have here. So the whole setup is not really extensive. And like most of the things that you can see here, so for example, everything in yellow and so on, these are just metrics. We have the orders as our fact table, and then we have different kind of dimensional tables with locations, supplies, products, and customers. So that's it. It's not really extensive, but the interesting thing is even when it's a very limited setup, so one fact table, four-dimensional tables, we can create a lot of insights already based on that. And as you can see here, they already defined a different kind of metrics as well, and we will look into the metrics in a second as well. This is where we get started. So you can start from the same kind of place. I put the link to the repository into the, into the description about my extension of this kind of model. I used this as a template. I created a new project, and I extended this project then. I set up everything here directly in DBT Cloud. You can do this locally with dbt core. There's definitely no limitation to do it. I just wanted to have something where I can easily show you something here in the browser, how I did diff different kind of things. As we can see here, classic dbt setups. We have our models here. Then we have in the basic setup that comes with the Jaffle shop, we have naturally all the staging models, which in the end mostly defining how we get the data from the sources into, uh, into our model. And uh, so not so interesting for us in this case. So then we have the different kind of mods, which is in the end like the, the star schema that we model here. So here, for example, we have the, the, the fact order table, just to show you here. So here we have the orders. And as you can see here, this is, this is what I said, like they are using already an extensive kind of setup. We also have all the unit test defines that you can now do in dbt. And then we have the semantic model with all the different kind of metrics that we also will use in the end. We will just build this matrix later on in Mixpanel, but it's a really good starting point. And this is like what you see here. Here are the different kind of metrics that have been defined for the orders fact table. And so this is where we get started. And as I said, like extending this is not so complicated. I have a new folder, which I call events, and then I have a stream table. And stream, I usually call a stream when I basically group all the events into one because this is the let's say the click or you, it's not really like click stream anymore. It's more like event stream, uh, but uh, it basically represents that we collect all the event data in one table and we can easily analyze, let's say, customer sequences, customer performance. Naturally, this event table just have one event because we just have an order fact table. So in a normal setup, we would might end up with 10, 15, 20 different kind of events coming from maybe different kind of fact tables there are also ways to derive events from dimensional tables. You can watch my other videos to see where I explain how you can do this. Uh, but here it's pretty straightforward because we already have a fact table. Here we just define the event. We define the timestamp. So we pick this from the ordered add column. Then we define the event name, which will be important later on. Then we have the customer ID, which we use as, uh, let's say, the unique identifier. Then we use the order ID as an event ID because it should be unique. And then here we basically make sure that we have some references for things that we want to map later on. And for example, we want, really make, want to make sure that we map location data later on. And so we have the location ID in here. Then additional information about the order, like the revenue, the cost, the tax paid. And then we have some conditionals like what kind of order is it? So I just take this from the existing Jeffel example and... One thing what I do now is, as I told you, I have the possibility here to enrich my data set already with some dimensional data because some dimensional data is maybe not so straightforward to add later on. And for example, one thing that we have here is we have all the different kind of order items. We have an order and we can have four or five different order items within this order. In a star schema, I naturally have to break it down in a different way because if I want to enable my BI system later to, for example, run a report on which kind of products have been bought. I need to put this in an additional dimensional table because, again, like an order can have different kind of items within the orders. I have to normalize this to make this possible. So here we do the opposite again, so we bring it back. We can bring it back because we have the possibility, for example, in Mixpanel, that we can have a property which is a list with different kind of objects, which is the classic card item. So 
card can have different kind of products, a list of products, and these products are basically represented by an object. And so this is the same thing what we already do here. Here, for example, I'm using BigQuery under the hood. So I can use the array aggregation functions to bring all the items for one order into this one row to the order. And then I just construct a JSON object, which in the end represents all the different kind of properties where I can put in all the dimensional data in here. I need it in this kind of format so you will see it when we sync it up into Mixpanel. I need it so that in the end Mixpanel knows, okay, these are all the different kind of properties. I have to place this into a JSON object, which in the end is pretty straightforward to do. Um, and so that's it. And so this is already our event table. Again, we just have one event, but we could easily extend this now to add four or five more events if we have different kind of fact tables as well. So this is step one. Step two is I want to use the location later to use it as a lookup table to map it with the location ID. And so here I just prepare what I actually need. And so this is just filtering down. I don't need any kind of all the information about this location, which is present. I just bring it down to the information that I need because it always makes sense to just pick the data that we need and don't push anything into the system that maybe we don't really need in the future. That's our setup. As said, it's pretty straightforward to go from a star schema to an event schema. And the next step for us is bring it all into Mixpanel. Just let me quickly do this. So I already prepared everything. It doesn't really take so long. This is not an extensive data set. But even if you have, let's say, 300,000 rows, it's not really long. So it's some seconds to load everything in there. Just let me quickly show you. So I basically have two warehouse imports. So first of all, I have defined my BigQuery data warehouse here as a warehouse source. Then I go here into data, and then I created two data imports. And so the one is like the stream with all the event data. And just let me quickly show you how it looks like. If you watch other videos from me, you already know how this whole process works. And so this is why I don't repeat it. Um, but again, like it's a uh, set, like uh, it's pretty straightforward. As we can see here, like this is like kind of event data that we pull in. And we can see here we have the event name, then we have a distinct ID, which is our customer ID. And then we have event time, which is like time of the order. And then we have an event ID, which is in the end like the order ID. And then we basically here map the properties that we have in a JSON field here to the JSON properties. And then Mixpanel already is like expanding it again to so that we can use them as a property within our model. Okay, so this was this part, and then we basically got the the location data in there, and this is a lookup table. So again, just maybe quickly show you lookup table I can pick here. So you can see I can either import an event table or I can import a lookup table. So dimension, location, I basically import as a lookup table. And the important part is here. So I define like the location ID is the join key. So location ID is present as a property within the order submitted event. The join key is like the location ID that I have in my database table, like in the dim location one. And I map this to location ID, which is a mixed panel property, which is present in the order submitted event. And so with that, I can then make sure that I get all the location name, for example, in here. So this is the join key, and then I get all the location name, and then I can use the location name in my reports to create reports with that. I could now add more dimensional tables. For example, I could get the information about the supplier here in as well. But well, so we keep the example simple to mostly show everything. This is just the setup. My major intent here was like to show you, it's not really hard to get what you already have to something that you can now put into Mixpanel. Now you might still have this big question in your head to say, okay, why should I actually even do that? Here's the reason. What I can do now is I can do, as a first step, it's pretty close to what I would do in any kind of BI tool. I could build something with the core metrics for all our teams that want to work with this. And so just to have a quick look in here, let's quickly go back. Core metrics. We go back into the model and or in the model definition to be uh, more precise. And then we have the different kind of metrics here. We have order totals, we have new customer orders, and then we have large orders. We have different kind of metrics that we can then show in our BI tool, but we can do the same thing already in Mixpanel. Still think there's definitely an opportunity if we build it here that our revenue team, for example, then can go in there, can take these kind of definitions that we have here and then extend it to their need. And I will show this in a second. As you can see here, so I just created the total orders. And so this is like the total sum of revenue. I created it by using aggregate property, go in here, pick sum, 
and then naturally I pick the revenue which we have and so by that I can just calculate the total revenue of orders. Then new customer orders is I just make sure so when I create a new event just to quickly show you how I build it. So when I create a new event so I pick an order submitted and then here I have the possibility to say I use a first time filter and first time filter just means is I just want to recognize this event for when it happens for the first time, which in the end translate into first time. This is how I build everything. So we have, we can see it here. So this is a filter on that. I do the same thing. I just calculate the revenue. And then I'm interested in this large orders. And again, like I calculate the revenue and I just add a filter for revenue greater than or equal to 20 or 30. And I can now pass this over to our revenue team. And then the revenue team says, okay, that's super interesting. But so for example, we would be really interested in to understand, okay, do we have, for example, do we have new customers who really submit a high order? So of course, like they can go in, they can go in and say, okay, you want to have revenue. And then again, greater than, let's use the same one. Because this is something they say, okay, like it's interesting to know about the large orders, but we definitely want to see how's the impact on you orders and just let me quickly rename that so new customers customer revenue with well, now they basically have extended the whole analysis which now makes it really straightforward to really understand that it could also be like a way that for example they want to really start down to understand this revenue a li little bit better so let's say they are interested maybe not in this one maybe not in this one let's say in these two ones and then they really want to understand, let's say, how this breaks down by location. And so here we can see we have the location ID. This arrow tells us that there's a map value. And here we can get the location name now. And now we can see where most of the orders are happening, where most of the new orders, uh, custom orders are happening. So at least like now revenue team can see, yeah, Philadelphia was our core store, still making uh, a lot of revenue for us. But Brooklyn definitely has a significant uptake in new customer orders. It's looking good. Maybe this is now starting to catch up. And this is what I mean by enabling different kind of self-service analytics. What I showed you here is definitely also like doable in any kind of BI tool. But I still like the way how you can do this here because I still have, at least like from my experience working with product teams and marketing teams, how classic analytics tools are breaking it down is closer to how these business teams work. Most of the people who work in marketing or in product have been working with classic analytics tools and so they have some background. And so for them, it's like understanding this is pretty straightforward. So like a BI tool is definitely something new they have to learn. And so here we can close the gap for them to make it easier to access the data. But there are definitely use cases that go beyond what you can usually do in a BI tool. So one thing is, so let's say our revenue team is quite happy with that, but they definitely want to understand how revenue is developing over time. So for them, revenue retention is something really important. And to build this in a BI tool requires an analyst to prepare everything in a table in a specific kind of format because it's not something that you get out of the box out of a star schema. So we go into retention, we build a new retention report, and so we have to select two events. So first one, which is which starts the cohort, and then the second one, which is the re the repeating or the retention, which defines the repeating and the retention behavior. We have just have one event, so, and we can just pick these events, right? Which is totally fine. We are looking at revenue retention. So revenue retention means is, so it starts with the first revenue, and then we look over time how it is repeating for each customer. So in the end, it's showing us how much revenue they do over time. So let's adapt this a little bit. So we are not interested on each day because we can have a shop where people come back every day and buy stuff, but let's say, oh, most of the time it makes more sense to go by months. So then we pick as months and let's go for six months. And as we can see here, the revenue team or the retention team, they can take a year off <laughs> because look at this retention rate. That's amazing. Again, this is the demo set that DBT has created. They should refine a little bit how they do the retention thing. But again, if you really work with proper data or with your data, so you will definitely see different things because we all want to end up here, but we won't. But this is a very powerful curve here. What it tells you is it tells you how you get 
additional revenue after the first revenue, which is here, the 100%. So it tells you how many additional orders you get after the first order that was starting here. Here in the end, we get a lot more orders. But this is a extremely powerful analysis for our, our revenue operations team because this gives them always like a quick insight into, okay, how is re retention revenue working? And they can create forecasts on that, which is super important to allocate more marketing budget, to allocate maybe other go-to-market strategies. They can do the same thing. So in the end, they could also now go in and do the same breakdown that we just did before. And we can just go in and break it down by the location again. As we can see here, we know Brooklyn is just getting started. Naturally, it looks like this. Um, and it's just launched one month ago. And so now what we can do is we can really see over time how, for example, Brooklyn is now developing and performing against the unmatched retention rate that Philadelphia still has. And this makes it extremely powerful. And this is the step that I mean is like what you can unlock for product, for growth, for marketing teams, or even for sales teams. We have an, uh, an e-commerce data set here, but it could be also like a B2B software as a service data set. You can create different kind of reports on the fly pretty quickly, and you can give them to the team. And then the team can go in there and can start to break it down in different kind of ways, can start to reshape in different kind of ways. And so the, maybe they don't break it down by location name, maybe they break it down by product to really see how product is performing over time. This makes it really powerful uh, for these teams to work with that. Another use case, so we were talking already about the, the marketing teams. And another thing, what I already mentioned in the beginning is we want to make it easy, especially, for example, for growth and marketing teams to do an analysis here and then take the results and immediately create initiatives based on that. Let's assume the retention rate is not stellar like this one. So let's assume, uh, let's assume okay, we have a normal retention curve, which would look like this. So let's assume, okay, we really want to make sure that the new Brooklyn store gets the people back and they buy uh, new stuff. And so we really want to make sure that we, in the end, create a win-back discount. So our marketing team is very eager to experiment with different kind of discount offers for a specific kind of segments within the buyer's life cycle. They could also work with a discount for people who have left things in their cart when we have the data. So right now we just have the data about order submitted, but we could extend the whole setup to also have, let's say, how many people added something to the cart, and then we could create this. But what we want to do now is we want to create a win-back offer for everyone who has bought something, but then we hope that they come back and buy something, but they haven't done yet. And so we want to create a special offer for them. We want to monitor the whole thing here within Mixpanel. What we can do is we can go here into cohorts. I already created two cohorts, and so let's have a quick look on this. So we have a welcome discount. We want to invite our new users that come show up in our shop. So we want to show them, look, you're really valuable for us, and we really want to have a long relationship with you. So we send them a welcome discount. What we can do is so we can create something where we say, okay, we first saw the, the customer in the, in the last 30 days and they already bought something in our place. After that, we send them a welcome discount. We already can see we have 56 people in this cohort. So this is great. So we can already visualize this and uh, I can show this in a second how we can do this as well. But let's have a quick look on the winback offer. Winback offers, so we say, some customers bought something and we really want to make sure that we only target the customers who bought at least an essential amount of money. We say, okay, it has to be at least dollars. And we want to check for the customers who did this in the time period. So like we look going back 30 days and then we look 90 days back and say, okay, did someone in this time period bought something? But we can definitely say because of this, that in the last 30 days, they didn't bought something and we are concerned. And we really want to make sure that they are coming back and buy something again. As you can see here, who did not submit an order in the last uh, 30 days. And so with this kind of cohort, so right now we have five, five people in here, we want to send them a special win back discount to bring them back. And, and again, as I said, we can quickly, we can visualize this. This is the nice thing here. So we can treat cohorts basically like events. So we can check, okay, how many people are in the welcome discount cohort and how many are in the winback ones. And as we can see here, you are starting out. So of course, welcome discount, not so much, but 
we got a lot new customers over the last days. And so we will send out a lot new welcome discount ones. And here, as you can see, these are all the winbacks, which are quite stable, but still ongoingly every day we can send out an email to get our customers back on track. How do we do that? We already have created this. And so what we can now do is we can just export this one. And uh, so now, of course, I get the warning. I have no integration. So I have no integration active because we are not just exporting a CSV list or whatever. No, we can actually just hook up our marketing tool and can just sync up the data in our marketing tool. We can check here. Let's assume our marketing team is using Brace. And so we can connect now Brace to Mixpanel and can sync up this cohort to Brace. And then in Brace, we now have a segmentation which is called a uh, welcome discount. And we can just create um, an email campaign or we can even create an SMS campaign and to send out this kind of discount code. And if we then use the proper UDM parameters, we get the data then back into Mixpanel again and we can analyze the impact of these kind of campaigns. So we can create a full circle for the marketing team to first of all create new initiatives based on the analytics data and then analyze the results of these initiatives within the tool without anyone helping them. So they can do it totally on their own. As you can see, they can also sync it out to Facebook ads and so on. So they have different ways how they connect the different kind of tools. And so the nice thing is, first of all, this saves you time in the data team. You don't have to prepare this manually. Even when it's just a one-time thing, then you just have to extend it. You still, you have to maintain it. We enable different kind of steps of self-service for the marketing team here to run more initiatives. And I think the real magic happens because like marketing team will now see Okay, actually, for me, it's not so hard. So marketing will see it's not so hard to just create, I don't know, four or five different kind of new segments here. And we can just quickly run a test to see, okay, does it really have an impact? We can maybe do a refined winback offer when we see like the winback offer was not really good. And so they can come in here, fine tune the different kind of cohorts that they want to, that they want to serve, and then optimize the campaigns based on that. And they can do it by themselves. And this unlocks so many new use cases for these different kind of teams. And this is like the level of self-service analytics that I like. It's not full-blown self-service analytics where we set up something once and then the teams are basically taking over and do everything by themselves. No, it's like we are unlocking new use cases with them. So we, it's again like the same example with the core reports. We provide some core metrics and then we can give it to the teams, show them how it works, and they can extend it for them. So they can create variation of these core metrics. They just copy and clone the metrics that are already there. And then they can create extension of that. And they can get one or two or three levels deeper, which makes it extremely valuable. And so this is the kind of self-service analytics that I like. This is not a dream castle. This is definitely possible. And to quickly recap, to enable these kind of use cases for the product, for the marketing growth and sales teams. The only thing what we have to do is we have to change a little bit the structure that we already have in place. We take the existing star schema, we reduce it to some degree, we transform it a little bit. So again, like we can add some dimensional values. So again, we can denormalize a little bit so we can take some dimensional values, already put it to the events at the point of time when they happen. Or we can just prepare some dimensions to later sync them up as lookup tables to extend our data set to make, so make it a little bit more flexible. And by that, we are ready. So by that, we can already get the data into Mixpanel and we can hand it over to our marketing, to our product and growth team, which most likely already will work in Mixpanel. For them, it's just an extension of what they already have, but with new data, with new possibilities, and yeah, and with definitely new insights. I hope this was helpful. If you have any kind of questions, because like you were trying to set this up and you ran into some issues, just let me know in the comments. Make sure that you like the video. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel because like I will produce a lot more videos about combining data warehouse data with your product analytics data. And so if this is interesting for you, make sure that you subscribe or check out the other videos in the channel and see you in the next video.